Hello, I'm Laura McCaughey, your host for this evening, and welcome to the third night of Soapbox Science Sydney Online. Over the last two nights, we've showcased six amazing Australian researchers, and we've got six more to share with you, starting firstly with Utkarsh Avarshni. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, upon whose ancestral lands UTSE City Campus, from which we are streaming, now stands. I would also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. Soapbox Science Sydney is a platform for both promoting female researchers and the research that they do, and also promoting an active and engaged dialogue between researchers and the public. This is a great opportunity to ask researchers questions directly, so please do ask as many questions as you like, the more the merrier. On this note, if you have any questions for Utkarsha during tonight's webinar, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. You can ask questions anonymously, and also if you like a question someone else has asked and would like it answered, then please use the upvoting tool, which is the wee thumbs up symbol next to the question itself. This session will also be recorded, but will not be recording any video or audio input from the audience. If you have any concerns or questions over this, you can contact the Soapbox team via email at soapboxsciencesydney at gmail.com. As mentioned, our speaker tonight is the brilliant Utkarsha Varshney. Utkarsha is a PhD student at the University of New South Wales, where she researches the degradation of silicon solar cells and develops new coatings to prevent this degradation. She is also an avid science communicator, taking part in the 2019 UNSW Three Minute Thesis Competition and Fame Lab Australia 2020. She also really loves pizza. I'll now hand over to Utkarsha for her to tell us about solar cells and pizza. And hello and welcome everyone from wherever in the world you are joining us. So as Laura mentioned, I am a solar energy researcher here at UNSW Sydney. Now, before I dig into what I do and why I do it, I would like to give a bit of a background or rather I'll start with the big question that motivated me. And that question was climate change or the climate crisis as we know of it. So climate change is not a new thing. We have been reading and hearing about it for a long time. But unfortunately, still now, it doesn't get as urgency as it should have gotten. So for some people, it could be a very complex process to understand, and then they think, oh, but we are not scientists, so why bother? For others, it could be something like they feel which is natural, so we cannot do anything about it. Well, unfortunately, none of these two are true. And hopefully by the end of tonight, I'll be able to break it down for you about what is happening, what has caused it, and what we can do about it. So first of all, what exactly is happening? Well, at the moment, our planet Earth is hotter than it has ever been. And when I say ever, I mean about hundreds of thousands of years. And to be precise, the planet Earth has seen about one degree rise in temperature. Now for some people, that one degree might not seem a very big number. Or maybe if someone would be thinking that last year, the highest temperature Sydney has, uh, has recorded was, let's say 40 degrees. So if this year it would be 41, that doesn't seem, I mean, of course it will cause a bit of a discomfort for a few days, but it still doesn't seem like the end of the world. Well, sure, it doesn't, but that is the case because that's not how we compare or how we think about the global temperature. When we say that the Earth's temperature has risen by one degrees, what we mean is, holistically overall, which includes the land, the water, air, and all our surroundings have gotten warmer or hotter. So the problem with this is with this increase in temperature, all the other uh, phenomenon or natural processes have seen a bit of a disbalance. And as a consequence, we are seeing crazy patterns in rainfall. We are seeing really extreme cases of floods on one side and droughts on the other. We are seeing an increase in our sea levels. We are seeing the disappearance of our snow cover. And last but definitely not the least, we have lost a lot of plants and animal species, much more than what we would like to think of. So now what we know that the problem is the earth is getting warmer. So now let's take a step back and think what exactly is causing it. 
So along with the increase in the, in the temperature of the planet, there was a substantial increase in the past 50 to 60 years in the carbon dioxide levels. So what does carbon dioxide do and why is it a big problem? So carbon dioxide is what we call a greenhouse gas. So what happens is sun being the ultimate source of energy and heat releases some heat waves. And when they strike on our earth surface, a part of it is absorbed and that controls the temperature making it suitable for humans and other species to work. But most of that energy, once it strikes the earth, is transmitted and radiated back to the space. So what happens is when there is more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide has a capacity to trap that heat. So instead of those heat waves going back to the outer space, they remain trapped in our atmosphere, which increases the heat and therefore increases the temperature. So that's what is happening. Now, the two points to summarize, our, temp our Earth is getting warmer and the cause of it is global carbon dioxide. Now, the third point is, uh, what exactly did we do in past few decades that has led to this increase? Well, more than two thirds of this global carbon dioxide emissions come from the burning of fossil fuels. So fossil fuels, which are a group of things like coal or oil, natural gas. Uh, so these things are nothing but dead remains of plants and animal species that died millions of years ago, deep buried inside the earth. So when we burn these fossil fuels, a lot of carbon, which makes all these things gets emitted and that leads to a carbon dioxide level of rise. So, uh, most of this burning in the fossil fuels happens in our power plants. And why is that the case? Because they deliver us our much needed electricity. So a part of the solution can be if we can find some new and cleaner ways to produce our electricity without harming our environment. So in, on those grounds, some people like me who work on producing electricity from the sun or the other researchers who work on producing electricity from wind. So the good part with the things like sunlight and wind is they are natural. Also, they are abundant. So most of the places on the planet have both sunlight and wind. Also, if we use a part of that energy today, we'll still be having the sunlight tomorrow. So that is also a thing. And therefore, because of its abundance, this is absolutely a free raw material. So on that ground, this is a bit of a foundation of why do we need sunlight to power our houses and heat our homes. So what I work on is something called a solar cell, and that is a device that converts sunlight into energy or electricity. So this was a bit of a background. So Laura, do we have any questions at this point? Hi, Karsha. Yes, we do. We've got some questions coming through. Um, we'll start with what kind of climate is best for solar power generation? I'm from Scotland and we barely see the sun. So would solar power work over there? Uh, okay, so that's a good question. So we definitely like, as per the definition, we definitely need more sunlight, but there's a catch. So with sunlight, we don't need a higher temperature. So after a certain threshold, the higher the temperature of the panels go, the less efficient they work. So we need sunlight, but we don't need a very hot climate. So I would say something like, like Sydney is a very good climate, I think, for solar energy. And like living in Australia, we have plenty of sunshine to be thankful for. That's good. Um, I don't think it would work in Scotland. It, we don't get warm weather, but we don't really get sunlight either. <laughs> um, we've got another question here. Can renewable energy be used to power air travel? Uh, yes, and we actually had our first flight, if I remember correctly, in 2017. So that was a flight that was first time a flight that was completely powered by solar panels. So actually, like on that note, the actual terrestrial applications that we see at the moment, or the things that you see on people's rooftops or in somebody's farms, are a bit later applications. The, the, the reason why solar energy or solar photovoltaics came into picture was space applications or the places where we cannot have the transmission lines or we cannot have the power poles which can transmit energy. 
and that's how it began and like the rest is history we are where we are today oh that's really cool i didn't know that you could have solar powered air travel um can solar power be stored like you would store energy in a battery for instance yes so good question. I think I'll be discussing more about it in my third section, but yes, it can definitely be stored. So solar power can be used in two ways. One is you can have like a solar installed system on your rooftop or wherever space you have in your house. And then supply what like you can use whatever energy you are producing and can deliver rest of it to the Australian grid or wherever country you live in. The other part is if you don't want to give it back to the grid, the other thing is you can use a battery. So if you are, if you are like, if it's a bright sunny day, you can store the surplus energy and you can use it in the night or you can keep it for a cloudy day or a bad weather day. So that's totally possible. Oh, that's really cool. Um, so you've, you've talked about, touched a bit on solar panels. How much do solar panels cost? Is it, um, is it a massive undertaking to put them on your house? Right, okay. So the price is also, again, something that I'll be touching on in the, in the next sections, but the price have come down tremendously. And the push or the solar, like the research community has always trying to boost up the efficiency for like on top and the cost a bit lower because that is always good. But at the moment, I would say, depending on how, how much do you have to spend and how good technology can you invest in, uh, the payback period for a, like a standard solar system should be around four to five years. So how much you would be investing to put that system on your rooftop should be completely free in the next four to five years. And the life, like the current lifetime of these panels is about 25 years. So certainly not a bad deal. Hmm, that's good to know. Um, we have a question here. If I live in an apartment and don't have a roof, can I access solar power? Can I borrow it from someone else's roof? Um, I'm not sure if you can borrow it directly from someone else's roof without going through the Australian grid. But that is like, I understand for the people who live in units or apartments, uh, you'll have to go through a much bigger process because the roof is not just for yourself, you're sharing it with your neighbors and other people. So I would say that, yes, it's a little bit difficult, but the other solutions in that case, if you live in an apartment is, uh, I'm sure like if there is a society, you'll have some sort of a park or for everybody in your apartment, you'll have a parking space and there will be like some sort of shade in that parking space. So even if you cannot use your rooftop, which is not completely yours, you can like you can use such places to install panels and then that can help everybody in the unit. Even if like, even if you can put a small system and that cannot help everybody's electricity needs, it might be useful to have some sort of like the lights in the common spaces or the lights outside the house in the night and things like that. Well, that's a good idea. Um, if the life of these solar cells is about 25 years, are you or any other groups working on increasing their lifetime that may encourage yes. more people to take them up? For sure. Okay. So that is also a big part of research that's going on, not particularly in my team, but generally among the photovoltaic community that currently the like the standard age for some some cells is about 25 years for most of them. For some, it can go up to 30, but 25 is like the rough standard at the moment. But the push is to take them to around 35 years, 40, or in some cases, 50 years as well. So for 50 years, if you have a system, you might not even need to replace it because like, yeah, it's pretty long time. 50 years is, is a good amount of time. Excellent. Um, so in terms of time, um, I'd like to move on to hear a bit more about your research and then we'll have some more questions in a few minutes. So as I ended the last section on solar cells, so by definition, solar cells are the devices that generate electricity from sunlight and they look something similar to what you can see on my, on my back. And these panels are up on about 95% of these panels that you see today are made up of silicon. And silicon is nothing but an extremely pure form of sand. So the processing of these solar panels, believe it or not, is similar to making of a pizza. As a pizza starts with a base, base and is then covered with a bunch of toppings. Solar cells starts with a base of silicon and they're then covered with some very thin layers on top that we call dielectrics. And as we can control the flavor of our pizzas with our choice of toppings, 
In the similar manner, we can control the properties of our cells with modulating these thin films on top of them. Now, you all know that our pizzas get burnt if we leave them in the oven for a long time. But what if I tell you that solar cells have a similar problem? Their ability to absorb sunlight and generate electricity actually reduces while being out in the sun for a few years. And although losing a slice or two of a pizza might not give a dent on your wallets, this degradation in the existing solar cells is costing us more than $2 billion every year. So in my PhD, I'm trying to devise some new solutions or ways that can solve this problem. So hold on a second. Solar cells getting degraded by the sun? That's very weird. Or in science terms, interesting. So what I'm doing in, in my PhD is trying to devise some new ways, also with another parameter that I don't want to increase the already existing cost. So my goal is to solve this degradation without adding any additional dollar into manufacturing. So what I've done is, in one of my experiments, I started with changing the thickness of these layers. And what I saw was, as I reduced the thickness of these layers, it simultaneously led into the reduction of this degradation, which was great because I'm not adding anything. All I'm doing is reducing something. So reducing the thickness of the layers means less money, which is always a bonus. So in another, in another experiment, what I found was, so these dielectric layers are is generally not one layer. We generally have a stack, which is a combination of few layers. And traditionally, there is a way how these layers have been placed. So in my research, I found that we can control this degradation significantly only by flipping the order of these layers. Exactly how putting a cheese slice before the sauce above it or both makes a difference for the pizzas. So in this experiment also, since I'm not adding any new layer, all I'm doing is flipping or changing their orders and placement. Again, we are not spending any additional dollar in manufacturing. So this method fortunately was tried and tested by one of our industry partners last year. And that was quite successful, which made me of course very happy. So that was a nice thing. So with all these new solutions, which I'm trying to develop and try to also scale up, my goal is that we can leave our planet with tastier pizzas and a healthier planet. Thank you. Thanks, Ikarsha. Um, I really like your pizza analogy. It makes it easy to understand, but you can't put the cheese on before you put the sauce on. That just doesn't work. <laughs> um, we've got some questions here. Have people tried to use different layers, different types of layers? Yes. So these dielectric layers that I was talking about, there is a big research focus on how to make them better, also how to make them cheaper and then thinner, because also like we are trying to make, so the reason behind using these layers is, I would like to add a little bit. So the reason why we need these layers is multifold. So one of it is when we, when we get like just a piece of silicon, it's very, very shiny and to, for something like solar cells, we need the sunlight, what it hits, we need, we want most of it to get absorbed. But if the surface will be very shiny, most of it will get reflected and that is not what we want. So one objective of these layers is to be a better absorber or to make them less reflective. There are other very chemical properties, but yeah, I think that would go into two technical details. So yes, there is a lot of focus on improving and like there are a few of my colleagues that are working on it. We are also trying to make it a bit of a faster process and cheaper process. And yeah, so the focus is on that. We've got a question here. I've heard that solar energy is less efficient and or economically viable than other forms of renewable energy. Is this true? And if so, what causes this? Uh, okay, so that is certainly not true. Uh, so I'll be giving you a bit of a timeline and from where we started and where we are today. So solar energy is uh, pretty much the most cost uh, competitive energy resource in renewables and not just in renewables. In a lot of countries now in different parts of the world, we have also achieved grid parity. So grid parity means uh, the solar energy prices are cheaper than the electricity that is generated by coal. So it's not just 
cheaper in comparison to other renewables, it's also cheaper in comparison to coal. Well, that's good to know. More people will take it up if they're going to save money. Um, is solar energy the most used renewable in Australia? I know in Scotland, for instance, it's wind power um, that's the mm. most used. So it's definitely like coming up like significantly, especially like living in Australia, we have about 2.1 million houses at the moment are powered by solar energy. And that is like compared to what, what population we have, it's one in every four house is powered by solar, which is great. So Australia is leading the rooftop solar, what we call. Uh, yeah, so I think Australia is really, really on a forefront of it and I'm something which I'm quite proud of. We're in the right place to be doing the research then. I'm glad. Um, solar cells have been around for a long time now. Is there any new and upcoming ways to better harness the energy of the sun or are we focusing on just improving solar cells? Uh, so improving solar cells is definitely key. So when, when uh, I, I'm like, I'm assuming this person is talking about when they say it's some other ways of harnessing. So the other ways of harnessing would be, as I was answering the previous question, that if we, if we modulate or if we modify these thin layers and it will be absorbing better, that will also improve our performance. On the other hand, there are other research focuses like uh, making different sort of architectures. So the industry has seen very different word records by many different kinds of solar cells. So here at UNSW also, we are working on different, different architectures. Some of them are really high efficiency architectures, which will like push the boundaries significantly. Also, there are some new, so as I was talking that most of this, like 95% of the market is currently silicon. What we are trying to come up in the new ways is there are some other materials that we are trying to find which can work in a similar or in a bit better, who knows, fashion than silicon. So there are other things like organic photovoltaics, which we can just fabricate in the lab with just dyes and chemicals. There are other things like perovskites. And yeah, so there is a lot of focus on getting it better because yeah, I think we still have a long way to go. That's good to know. Um... Why are the solar cells in the modules always blue? Uh, good question. And uh, I'll, I'll actually sh have something to show you on that question. I'm glad somebody asked it because this is a question that I get asked quite frequently. So the reason why they are blue is, again, because of the dielectric layers that I was talking about in the previous section. So the topmost layer is something what we call a silicon nitride layer. So that blue color comes from how the, the researchers have optimized it. So, or optimized rather its thickness. So if you change the thickness of that topmost layer, the colors will be different. So I have some cells here to show you, which um, I made with different thickness and they are um, of different color. So I think some people will be happy to see it. Here's what I prepared earlier. <laughs> <laughs> So this is one, Ooh. you can see it's, it's yellow in color. Then there is, um, so this is a bit pink. Ooh, I like that one. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. It looks like our little soapbox lady. Yeah, with, with pinkish colors, correct. So yeah, so all, like this is just like all I've changed in, in these samples, which is different from the actual standard ones that you're used to seeing is they have different thickness of that silicon nitride layer. So the only, the blue color, why we see it? Because the industry has optimized the thickness of the silicon nitride to work perfectly in the cell. And that particular thickness by chance gives the blue color. Oh, well, there you go. You learn something new every day. <laughs> um, why do higher temperatures make the energy production less efficient? Uh, okay, so that will go into a bit of equations, but yeah, so what happens is also like, I didn't mean that colder climates will make them perform better. What happens is the way they are structured, the higher the temperature goes, the degradation will also be faster. So what I do is like, if, like what my day-to-day -day life looks like in the, in the lab, I try to uh, like, instead of keeping the cells at 25 degrees or 30 degrees, what they would have otherwise experienced on our roofs or on our farms, I increase the temperature to see the degradation faster. So what happens is if the temperature will increase or let us suppose in climates like 50 degrees or uh, 60 degrees or in some extreme cases, what happens is 
the, the higher the, tempera the temperature goes, the faster the cells will degrade. So they will perform worse than they otherwise would have. And also their life eventually will be a bit shorter. Okay. We've got a question here about recycling um, solar panels. So if they only last 25 years, can they be recycled or do they end up in the landfills? Right. So I think I'll, I'll leave that question for after my final session because I'll be talking about recycling a bit there. Oh, excellent. Okay, well, in terms of um, time, we'll move on and hear a bit more about your research, seeing as there's a lot more questions um, for you to answer. Um, and we'll finish the Q&A in a few minutes. So, okay, so where I ended was, I was talking about how I am trying to solve this degradation. So now in this section, I'll pretty much be talking about some other research focuses that we have. And also we'll be telling you a bit about the timeline of the industry. So something that like the solar cells started as only a 1% efficient device in about 1950s. And in just a matter of few decades, today what we see most of the things like these look about 22, 23% efficiency. So which is like a tremendous leap that the industry has taken. In terms of cost, would you believe that only since 2010, the cost has reduced by more than 84%. So if at all you were paying, let's say about $100 in 2010, you're only paying 16 bucks today, which is quite fabulous. And still what we are trying to do is we're still trying to push our efficiencies to make the cells better. And also if the efficiencies will be better and the performance would of course be better and therefore the price would be less. So these are two things that always go and they always are in the focus of researchers. Along with that, there are other things like somebody asked, uh, I think I'll probably start with the recycling question. So recycling is something which is quite a new research arena in the focus because up until 10 years ago or five years ago, we didn't used to think too much about how much waste will we finally be giving for the planet because the big part is to save the planet, not to like, yeah, degrade it further. So at the moment, to give you a perspective in numbers, only in 2018, more than 11 million solar panels were installed only in Australia. And just to compare with this, if we'll be continue, like if we'll continue growing it or continue installing it in this fashion, what will happen to all those panels after 25 years when they'll be stopped working? And that's a question which is currently a huge focus in the industry and in the research. So what we are trying to do is we are taking the panels which are already worn out or they are not in operation anymore and trying to see how much can we recycle or how much can we take from the old panels and use it back. So part of it is not going too much into recycling the old cells, but the recycling of other things. Like if you see the panel behind me, solar cells only make the electric part of it. There are other things like glass. There are things like, like the silver strips that you are seeing, that sort of metallization. So there are a few things that we can recycle and the few things that we cannot. But the push at the moment is we really want to recycle whatever we can. So instead of like, basically like the final goal is to, create as less waste as possible. So that is part of the recycling. Also, I think prior to the previous question, somebody asked about extending the timings. So at the moment, sitting at 25 degrees is also a good enough time for uh, an electricity source, which is absolutely, doesn't make any sound, doesn't create any smoke. So 25 years sounds like a good time. But other than that also, at the current moment, the focus is to increase that timeline that they have or lifetime to about 30 years or 40 years, in some cases, 50 years as well. So along with that, there are some new high efficiency architectures that people are working on to push the efficiencies further because uh, silicon has some sort of a threshold limit and we cannot go beyond that. So we are trying to find new materials that we can compile with silicon to make something what we call a tandem. So a tandem is pretty much like a combination of two materials. Um, also, I think before I finish, there is one thing that I would definitely want to touch on and that is batteries. And I think someone also asked a question about it. So that is something uh, that renewable energy sources, not just solar, but all of 
all of those things are criticized about that that is irregularity that sun only shines in the day or we don't have wind in some days or the other so those things uh, make it a big of a problem that uh, we need to solve which is storage so what happens with storage is at the moment we have batteries so we definitely have batteries that can complement our solar panel installations so if you don't want to get your installations connected to the grid or you don't want to give the surplus supply of energy to the grid what you can do is you can store it for yourself and can use it in the bad days or in the days when you don't have sun or at night or whenever it suits so in that case what happens is the current problem is the prices of the battery storage is still quite significantly high so when we compare the prices like there is a tremendous decline as i mentioned in the prices of solar panels batteries on the other hand we still are in a long way short to uh, make them like quite economical or feasible that everyone can get it so but that being said there is a quite a big focus not just here in australia but globally to improve this storage and to improve batteries and yeah i think i'm hopeful that that battery problem will also be soon resolved so yeah that was pretty much from me thanks akarsha we've got quite a few questions coming through um i'll start with the one on batteries because you've just mentioned them there Will the prices of batteries be cheaper in the future? Should we see yeah. them come down like the price of solar cells? Uh, yes, definitely. Because again, in the battery space also, what they're trying to do is they're trying to make the materials either they're trying to devise new materials, which are cheaper, or they're trying to change the designs, the way batteries are made. And also, I think a big part of like a big part of reducing the cost of any new technology is on how much or how yeah I mean pretty much about how much capacity. So for solar also, since uh, like the way we are seeing the installations now and the capacity globally, which is increasing, uh, that was not the case like 15 years ago or 20 years ago. The same situation is batteries in today. So once we start to use more batteries. The progress will be further, like they'll start reducing the prices along with. But yes, I mean, the focus, the way the research is, because there is a lot of research groups worldwide, which like they're solely uh, trying to reduce the cost of batteries at the moment. Well, that's good to know. Um, if not a lot of people at the moment can afford the batteries, can you make a lot of money by having solar panels on your house and then selling the electricity back to the government? And if so, yes. how much could you make? Uh, I'm not sure about how much because that will depend on multiple factors. So first of all, it will depend on the quality of the panels that you have. Second one will depend on how many members in the family do you have because that will depend how much electricity do you use. And then also it will depend on uh, different places have different amount of money that the grid is paying you back. So I don't think I can give you like a one solid number that you can save this much. But yes, that definitely care is an option. And most of the places, uh, since the battery prices are still higher, most of the systems are what we call a grid connected solar systems. So you can use whatever you want to use and the surplus can go to the grid. The problem on that side uh, in some places is most of the grids globally, I'm not just talking about Australia, are quite old. And when they were built, we didn't have anything like solar or wind or nuclear or anything so it's some some in some places it's quite hard to get that grid integration possible so i think that is a bigger problem to solve than the prices are there any incentives by the government to take up solar panels or to sell your electricity back to the grid so there were a lot of these intensive programs uh, at different times in different countries. So Australia had some, US also had some, Germany had quite a few. Uh, they are now a little bit uh, like lesser in intensives than they were in the past. But I think that is a consequence because now a lot of people are taking it. Like as I mentioned here in Australia, one in every ho five houses is powered by solar. So it's not something that people don't know anymore. Yeah. The intensives from the government usually comes at the pay rate when they really need to spark the beginning of something absolutely new. 
But yes, there are still some intensives, both for like installing solar cells for yourself and for giving it to the grid. How many solar panels would an average sized house need to be self-sufficient? Um, okay, so that also uh, is managed by a couple of factors. One of them is how much electricity do you need? That will again comes to how many members do you have? It, is it just two people? Or do you have a big family, about five or six people? So that will definitely like, because that will control how much do you spend or also how much will you save if you have like a bigger system. Second thing will be how much space does your rooftop allow? So for some people, it could be uh, like even the house is big, but it depends what kind of roof you have. Other way there is also like for some people, the roof shape also matters because like in some cases you might not have like a straight installation or if you have like a slanting roof, you can only put some part of it or if it's like south facing, you cannot put some part, some solar panels on that side. So I think that will depend on a lot of factors. Okay. Um, if solar power is so efficient and it's getting much cheaper, why is there still such a reliance on fossil fuels? Um, okay, so that can go a little bit on a political side of things, but I'll try my best to be uh, as linear as possible. Okay, so there are still some few challenges. One of them is, like, as I mentioned, I think a couple of minutes ago was grid integration. So most of the grids globally, uh, okay, so even if not, I, I shouldn't say most of them, but a good share of the grids in most of the countries in the world are not very happy with the grid integration, particularly more if you are trying to put a lot more into it. So that is one of the reasons. Second reasons is, is still, uh, I mean, although research wise, it's not an upcoming or a budding technology, but still the, it doesn't have a very fair share of, uh, of, of it in the energy market or in the absolute energy hole for a country. So I think some of the reasons is, uh, I, I shouldn't say that, I, I mean, personally, I don't think it's cost anymore. A big part of is, is politics. I think I'll leave it there. And uh, also, I think once the politics or the, I think society on a whole in general is affected a lot by what our leaders are saying. So in some countries, if the leaders are not very pro on getting into it, we are still, I think that is one of one, I think that's a, that's a bit of a gap that needs to be bridged between the science community and the politicians. Yep, I, I hope it will right. get bridged as soon as possible. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, so going back to your research, if your research is successful, which it sounds like you are making a lot of progress, what will be the benefit to the Australian economy and its way of life? Okay, so I think that's, that's a good question. So one of the reasons why I was very interested in this degradation that I'm studying and trying to solve is a lot of the installers and I would say most of the public are not aware of it. When an installer comes to your house and they'll say that, uh, oh, this is a solar panel. And then you say that, sure, like what's the efficiency? What they don't tell you is, uh, I mean, they, they'll say that, okay, this is 20% efficient and the lifetime is about 20 years. What they don't tell is that that 20% will not stay 20% for the entire 20 year period. And that is where this degradation comes into play. So this is something which I and like a few colleagues here at UNSW are trying to solve the problem that most of the people are not even aware of. And as I'm saying, like I, I was saying that this is a big problem that globally account for more than $2 billion. In Australia being the world leader in rooftop solar, I think our rooftop industry will significantly improve or especially like for our people, I think that that is a big share of it. And for our people, there will be a significant boost of the, I mean, the, the return and investment of their money that they're doing. And they're not like without knowing that in the five year period or the 10 year period, the deficiency can drop down significantly. So that was like, yeah, my primary objective. Thanks for that. We've only got time for one more question and it's going to be, why did you get into research in the first place and what is it you love about it? Um, okay, so I think I've always, uh, okay, so I, I think science for me or research in general for me is all about curiosity. And that is one of the reason I always be more curious no matter how much I know. 
and not just on the research side. So along with like, although I am a researcher, most of my time goes into reading research articles. Other than that also, I read a lot. So I read a lot of newspaper articles, clippings, books, and these things. So curiosity was certainly one factor what motivated me to go into research. Uh, why I went into solar research particularly was, um, Okay, so I did my undergrad in electrical engineering and back at home in India, electrical engineering is a bit of a heavy engineering. So what we do is we study uh, things like transformers and generators, which are like huge in size, they're giant. So when I studied about solar panels for the first time, that was something that opened my eyes absolutely, because first, they are relatively smaller in size. Second, there is no sound, no noise, no smoke, no rotation of anything. I mean, that thing is just sitting there doing its thing. And that fascinated me quite a bit. And I think it still fascinates me. So, yeah. Well, that's a really nice answer. Um, and the backdrop of a solar panel is much nicer than the backdrop of a transformer would have been. Um, <laughs> that is true. Well, I'd like to thank you for a brilliant talk today, Karsha. And I'd also like to thank everyone who attended and asked questions. If you want to watch this talk again, or you know someone who would have enjoyed it, we'll be posting it on our website in the next few weeks. You'll also receive a post-event email in the next 24 hours with an evaluation survey. Please fill this out as it helps us gauge the success of our events and make improvements for next year. We couldn't run Soapbox Science Sydney without our amazing sponsors. So I'd like to thank the University of Technology Sydney, the University of Wollongong, Equus and Excite On Science for their continued support. As I said earlier, we still have five more talks lined up as part of Soapbox Science Sydney 2020, starting with Siobhan Bradley in 15 minutes. Siobhan will be talking about solar energy as well, but she'll be talking about the process of capturing the light rather than stopping degradation. You can join all of the five remaining talks from the link you're on now, or you can find more information on our website, soapboxsciencesydney.com. Thank you again for attending, and we hope to see you at our next talk.